Noah Rothman. A guy who I think really gets it. Uh, he is the uh, just written the book, The Rise of the New Puritans, uh, The War on Fun. Really? Noah, welcome to the program. How are you, sir? Very well. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You bet. You bet. So Stu and I are in the midst of uh, reading your book. Uh, we haven't got it all the way to the uh, end yet. But um, I, I, I have to ask you, do, do progressives know that they're almost embarrassingly unfun right now are they do they know this no they they absolutely don't they would reject the premise and they sort of uh recoil at the the assertion that they're pursuing some sort of a moral framework that they have imposed this moral framework on every aspect of life especially the apolitical aspects of life they don't see themselves as less fun less chill, uh, <laughs> less accommodating than their parents and grandparents. But they most certainly are. They're having less fun. They're having less sex. They're oh, enjoying uh, life uh, less than their elders. They're having less sex? Oh, yeah. You haven't gotten to that chapter? That's a good one. <laughs> no. Um, so that's, that is my very salacious chapter on sex and booze. It's, called, it's titled Temperance. All the chapters are organized around unimpeachable moral values. Because they are pursuing a moral ideal about how society should organize itself. So when you think of progressives, you don't think uh, they have sexual prescriptions, right? But if you dig into the literature around the many proliferating sexual identities, it's not about self-gratification or self-fulfillment. It's about the political program associated with these things. This has to pursue and advance a political agenda. You couple that with the labyrinthine uh, consent requirements now in statute in places like California, but mostly in norms and college campuses. And you have this unnavigable uh, labyrinth that has been erected around um, consent, which is absent consent is obviously a crime. But we've created now real legal and moral and social consequences if a cue is misread or a signal is overlooked or it's just human behavior intervenes in this uh, process, this complicated process. The result is less sex people are reporting especially young people are reporting having much less casual intercourse than their parents did okay i i have to i have to tell you first of all it is a religion what they're doing is a religion so you've got puritans absolutely right um and they are imposing it on all of us but i i look at people who are like this and i think to myself how could you not be just miserable if you believe all the things that they believe, it's just a life of misery. Yeah, they don't see themselves as miserable, but they are making their compatriots miserable. Um, <laughs> maybe nine out of the ten people I spoke with are um, who would most of them wouldn't go on the record for fear of consequences, saying the things that they actually think. But those who did, which is weird. Democrats, yeah, well, I mean, there are real social and, and professional consequences for going against this movement. It's not a big movement, but it punches way above its weight. And so these guys are Democrats. Um, they vote Democratic. They wouldn't vote Republican with a gun to their head. But they didn't get into the business of making delicious food and writing screenplays and doing it, broadcasting sports because they wanted to do politics. They don't. They've just been drafted into this movement, and it's sapping them of enthusiasm for their life's work, and they really, really resent it. No, can you go through so some of these? It, you have so many great examples in the book of of this type of thing. The hummus place well, is one. I'd like to hear about the burrito truck. Tell burrito about the truck, burrito okay. truck. A, a truck that was in the Pacific Northwest. These two women um, went down to Mexico, fell in love with the food, interviewed chefs, picked up some recipes, brought it back to the Pacific Northwest, and it was a profound success. They were very commercially successful. In fact, a lot of the people who are targeted by this movement are successful. And I think that mm -hmm. the, their success engenders quite a bit of resentment. Um, but they brought it back to the Pacific Northwest and this, the media environment down there, which is beholden to this pro progressive set of ideas, just went about destroying the thing because they had stolen this heritage from, um, from the, the hardworking people of Mexico. They hadn't given them any credit. They weren't uh, giving them the proper remunerations they were due. It's a very nebulous idea of what, what they violated, what prescriptions they ignored. But the, this thing was destroyed. These two women were driven out of business, and their burrito truck, which was fetid, which was loved, 
was uh, was driven under um, out of business. Uh, in part, so I this... think also because it was so good, but, but they had violated some unspoken, unwritten ideal uh, about whatever cultural com- uh, appropriation is. It's very difficult to define, but it's believed to be some form of theft, as though culture is a, uh, a zero-sum game and that it so... has been commodified in some way. When I when I read that and I I thought about it, I I had just seen the new Elvis movie. Have you seen the new Elvis movie? I haven't. I heard it's good. It's very, very good. Um, But it taught me something about Elvis. I didn't know. I didn't know that he was so poor after his dad died that he and his mom lived in a black community in Memphis, which never happened. He was like the only kid in this white kid in this black community. So he grew up in that culture. He grew up with the music. That's why he moved the way he did. Um, And the, at the time, the programmers of radio, many of them would have loved to play the black music, but they couldn't put a black man on the air and when they heard his music, it was the black uh, culture and black music sung by a white guy. And, you know, it shows B.B. King and all of these legends who were friends of his going, man, take it, take it. I'm glad people are are listening to it. Now you would look at that and it would be cultural appropriation. And they would hate, and I think they probably do, hate Elvis and anybody like him because he was just stealing that. No, he wasn't. He was popularizing it. He was breaking a barrier. Yeah, popularizing it and and creating synthesis. Um, And there is this idea abroad that synthesis in music and culture and cuisine is some sort of form of theft. Is there needs to be uh, there's a racial essentialist element that's put to this that suggests that any creativity in uh, creating works of art and amalgamating and synthesizing various influences into some finished product uh, represents some form of attack on culture, uh, even though what you just said is absolutely correct in, for, in art and food and in music. You're exposing new audiences to this thing. You're creating a, a broader understanding and acceptance of these cultural traits, albeit perhaps amalgamated, not necessarily adulterated. They confuse the two, probably deliberately. Um, but the expansion of and broadening of the exposure to these ideas, these cultural traits, uh, used to be something that we would celebrate and accept as, as an right. unadulterated good. Uh, it is not anymore. I know, I know there was a guy who I grew up listening to on the radio. He was very, very good. His name was Charlie Brown. He was uh, originally at uh, KJR in Seattle and then Cube. And I I studied at his feet. Uh, I was lucky enough to to work with him when I was very, very young, and I watched him, and I talked to him. When I started doing my own show, I called him up and I asked him, hey, Charlie, can I, can I steal this and this and this from you? And he just laughed, and he said, and I think this is true with almost everything because it's not – you're not living in a vacuum. And he said, Glenn, you steal from me. You've stolen twice. And – that's what we don't understand, that it all is just kind of, that's where you get your inspiration and you take it and you make it your own and you move, not stealing things word for word, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let, me, uh, let me ask you, uh, because I'm, I'm watching, I mean, I know you're a, your IQ is a lot higher than mine, and I don't know if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're watching like The Marvelous Miss Maisel, which I think is fantastic. Um, but it centers around this woman in the 1950s, early 1960s, who wants to be a comedian. And uh, one of the running characters is Lenny Bruce. And Lenny Bruce would absolutely be in progressive jail right now if he lived today. And you had all of these great comedians that were there to push back on the man. Whatever it was, they push back. These people like Ricky Gervais um, make it, I think, because they don't apologize and they don't stop. Can you talk a little bit about the effect of apology and what's happening in, in comedy? Yeah, um, the very same 
uh, sentiments, policing of public morality that took aim at Lenny Bruce, at George Carlin, at Richard Pryor, are at work today. The executors of this campaign uh, are not on the right. Um, they used to be. This, you know, the, the tendency that saw uh, something that would corrupt you and degrade society and innocent cultural fare used to be a tendency native to the right, uh, in part because we are all heirs to this puritanical tradition. It has found a home in both political coalitions over the years. Um, on When it comes to comedy, one of the things that you see now among this particularly puritanically inclined progressive is to emphasize the pain that someone had to endure in order for you to enjoy something as trite as a punchline. Um, you know, you see this in the fans of the, the comedian Hannah Gadsby, who's an anti-comic and who is funny when she wants to be. She doesn't always want to be. Sometimes she will build the same tension that would otherwise lead to a punchline and give you that release uh, and doesn't break the tension, just lets you sit and marinate in it and absorb her pain. And then maybe interrogate you about that joke that she told five minutes ago and ask you why you thought that was funny. Why was my suffering funny? And that's what they love so much. They love the anguish. They love the ardor because it is a sign of your um, your prudent understanding that suffering exists in this world. And if you don't dutifully dwell on it every second of your life, you are sacrificing a moral mission to advance the progressive project and make the human experience just a little bit more you know, tolerable. This is a very puritanical ideal. When it comes I've to never heard. Go ahead. Uh, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. I've got to take a quick break. I want to get to the apology, yeah. and then I want you to explain a little bit deeper this, this anti-comedian. I'd never heard that term before anti-comedian and and you know it's different than like andy kaufman who just for his own entertainment would just make people wildly uncomfortable uh, but that's a completely different uh look as i understand it we're talking to noah uh, rothman he is the author of the rise of the new puritans a great book you want to understand what's going on with the left and this new religion and how it, it affects everything the Rise of the New Puritans by Noah Rothman. Back with him in 60 seconds. Noah, I would, uh, I would love to uh, do a podcast with you and spend uh, you know, at least an hour with you on this, this topic. You've, you've really nailed it. Uh, the book is The Rise of the New Puritans. Um, tell me about the apology. So when we, all, we are often bombarded with demands that you apologize for your conduct, the apology provides you no absolution. Um, and that's where I differ from a lot of the very uh, brilliant scholars uh, who have called this a purely secular faith. I don't see it as entirely a faith, because in a faith in the Western tradition, there is theism that expiates sin. There can be no absolution for sin in this particular faith, because there is no deism. Uh, and because it is such an all-encompassing social code, I, I liken it more to Puritanism, because Puritanism wasn't just a faith. It wasn't just congregationalism. It was a way of life. It was a totalitarian philosophy by definition, mm -hmm. because it was total. Um, when it comes to the apology, the apology, as we've all observed, um, makes you just a more delicious target and trains more fire on you. Um, and this isn't just true in comedy. This is, there's several... Uh, examples of that in the comedy chapter, but there's a particularly interesting anecdote that I lead off the book with about a um, a grocery, a grocer in um, in uh, Minnesota that was again very popular, very successful. It was feted uh, by Keith Ellison on the house of the floor of the House of Representatives. Dr diners, drive-ins, and dives. Guy Fieri featured it. So it turned out that this the owner of this grocer had a daughter who in her youth, uh, 14 and 18 respectively, made racially insensitive remarks online. This was picked up by uh, the online community that they attempted to force him to, uh, to apologize and, uh, and to uh, make absolution for his sins. He had to fire his daughter. Uh, that was not good enough. He pledged that mm. she would devote herself to good works for the community. That was not good enough. Eventually, uh, the holder of his lease terminated the lease. Because oh my gosh. it was because that was the penit that was the penitence that was deserving of the sin he had committed, the uh, careless parentage of a willful daughter, and this this is as moral a code as you could find. It goes mm. back to the founding of the country. But when you are apologizing in any other tradition, you would find 
some absolution. This particularly uncompromising tradition offers no uh, no absolution for offenses against it. It is. Uh, I, I will tell you, you're right about this as as a um, a completely different kind. You don't call it a religion. I do. I just think it's an an anti Christ style religion. There is no forgiveness, uh, and without forgiveness, we f- we cease to function normally as a society. You you. You just can't live in a society where there is no forgiveness, where you're held accountable not only for everything you've ever done, but also anything your ancestors have done. That's a pretty shallow pool of good people that can be swimming around. Um, <laughs> Noah, thank you so much for, for being on the program today. I'd love to have you back. Love to do a podcast with you. Uh, the book is The Rise of the New Puritans, Fighting Against Progressives, uh, Progressives' War on Fun. Noah Rothman is the author.